everyone. Welcome to our event tonight, The Future of Criminal Justice with Michigan Law's Ellie Savit, Washtenaw County Prosecuting Attorney. Ellie will be in conversation with JJ Prescott, U of M's Henry King Ransom Professor of Law. Um, if you have any questions, please go ahead and submit them via the, the Q&A feature, which you'll see on the bottom of your screen. And uh, myself or JJ will bring up the questions with Ellie. Um, at the end of the program, we'll have an opportunity for question and answer. Um, so we'll address those questions at the time. And um, before we get started, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our speakers for tonight. Oh, I'm Alana, I'm UMDC Vice President. Welcome everyone. Um, at the end, we'll also talk about some of our upcoming events as well. L.A. Savid is the prosecuting attorney for Washtenaw County, Michigan. He was elected in 2020 and was sworn in on January 1st, 2021. He ran on a platform of equitable justice for all and criminal justice reform, which he focused on in his previous position as senior advisor and counsel to Detroit Mayor Mike Duggan from 2016 to 2020. As senior advisor, Ellie also maintained a policy portfolio that encompassed consumer protection, education, environmental justice, infrastructure development, and public safety. He is also an adjunct professor at the University of Michigan Law School. Ellie served as a law clerk for Justice, for Justice Sandra Day O'Connor and Ruth Bader Ginsburg on the U.S. Supreme Court, the Honorable David Tattle on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit, and the Honorable Carlos T. Bea on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Ellie has published scholarly articles on such topics as state and local government, educational equity, campaign finance reform, and environmental law. He regularly consults with civil rights groups and environmental organizations in Michigan and across the country. He holds a JD from the University of Michigan, a master's from Pace University in New York, and a BA from Kalamazoo College. Welcome tonight, Ellie. Glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm now going to introduce Professor Prescott, and then I'll turn it over to him for the rest of the program. JJ Prescott is the Henry King Ransom Professor of Law at the University of Michigan Law School. JJ Prescott's research interests revolve around criminal justice, sentencing law and reform, employment law, and the dynamics of civil litigation, particularly settlement. He is also the principal investigator of the U of M online court project, which uses technology to help people facing warrants, fines, and minor charges re resolve their disputes with the government and courts online and without the need to hire an attorney. He clerked for the Honorable Merrick B. Garland on the U.S. Court of Appeals, District of Columbia Circuit. Professor Prescott earned his BA at Stanford, his JD from Harvard Law School, and his PhD in economics from MIT. Welcome, JJ. I'll go ahead and turn realized, it over to you. I realized I was muted. Uh, of course, <laughs> that has to happen uh, every, every Zoom session. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you very much, Alana, for the for the introduction. I'm so excited to be here uh, with Ellie today. Um, and, uh, you know, greetings from Ann Arbor, where we uh, just got a, a dump of snow. So, e you know, I, I'm sure pretty much everybody uh, on this uh, Zoom meeting has had a lot of snow recently. Maybe not everybody, but a lot of you. Uh, but we're, we're sort of way over average, I would say, even, even for us. But um, I'm really excited to to have 45 minutes before we get to questions to, 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 to try to draw Ellie out on his uh, experience, his path and what he's doing now in the Washtenaw County Prosecutor's Office. Um, so maybe I'll just uh, start it off, Ellie, by asking, you know, about your interest in criminal justice and, how, you know, where that came from. Um, I would like to claim that I had a part in that, but unfortunately I wasn't your criminal law professor. So, uh, you know, it had to come from somewhere else. Um, and, you know, in addition to that, what made you decide instead of practicing, at least at this stage in your life in the private sector, what made you decide to run for office uh, to address these um, issues? Sure, and, and obviously JJ, the loss is mine not to uh, have you as a professor, but, um, you know, I, I actually had a, uh, sort of unorthodox route into my interest in criminal justice reform and criminal justice issues because, uh, you know, I am not a prosecutor by training. I am not really a criminal lawyer 
by training. I've done some criminal law while I was in private practice, but it wasn't uh, my, my, my bread and butter. Uh, what, what I really saw, uh, and it started actually uh, before I was in law school when I was an eighth grade US history teacher, is the various ways in which the collateral consequences of our criminal legal system affect so many people. I was an eighth grade US history teacher in uh, New York City public schools. And I had kids that were justice involved, kids whose families were justice involved. And that justice involvement impacted the students' lives. Uh, you know, having a parent that's involved in the justice system can be severely traumatizing, severely destabilizing. Uh, so, you know, that, that really started to impart in me uh, the, the, the real fact that what stops uh, in the courtroom doesn't really end there. Uh, you know, after I went to law school and had some great uh, criminal uh, and criminal adjacent uh, professors, although although somehow I missed you, JJ, uh, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I, I clerked on the on the US Supreme Court. And what's interesting there is uh, one one thing that you do as a law clerk is you really get a 30,000 foot overview of everything that is going on in uh, the, the justice system in the United States, because you have to review pretty much all of the uh, petitions that are coming into the Supreme Court. And the vast majority of those, or roughly about 70% of those, I think, are either criminal or criminal law adjacent, uh, either criminal petitions or people seeking to overturn their convictions via habeas or prisoner rights cases. And the truth of the matter is, there wasn't a lot that could be uh, done from the Supreme Court's perspective because everything that was being done to folks was legal, right? There wasn't a legal error there, but you read these petitions and you're like, that, well, that's not right. That's not justice. And that's really unfair. At the same time, uh, you know, I remember this when I was in DC and, and riding the bus every day to my, to my job at the Supreme Court, I read Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, which uh, you know, I, I thought at the time, I was like, that is a provocative title to uh, make the claim that we are still in many ways living uh, under a Jim Crow system in the United States of America. But she very uh, provocatively, but persuasively made the case that uh, the, the adverse collateral consequences of our justice system uh, are have recreated what we've seen uh, throughout American history uh, through uh, Jim Crow and, and de facto and de jure segregation because what a criminal record does is it prevents people from getting housing, from getting jobs, from accessing education, those very same things that we by law prevented black people and people of color from obtaining in uh, the Jim Crow South. And in the United States of America, we incarcerate more people than any country on the planet. Uh, and uh, black people are six times more likely than white people to have a criminal record. So by its terms, what we've done through the criminal legal system is in many ways re recreated that uh, system. So, so that experience while I was working on the Supreme Court and seeing what was going on across the country really crystallized to me uh, the, the deep and cascading inequities in our criminal legal system. Uh, I, you know, I then decided to move back to Michigan and uh, I got involved with uh, the city of Detroit where I led our criminal justice reform work. And, and you saw that uh, right then and there every single day. One of our major priorities at the city was trying to get people back to work. But so many people were carrying around old criminal records from decades earlier. And that criminal record was basically a lifetime punishment that was preventing people from being able to get into jobs for which they were otherwise qualified. So we worked, uh, you know, to 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 uh, uh, get people's records expunged, and uh, you know, JJ JJ was actually quite instrumental in getting probably the farthest reaching package of uh, expungement bills passed in the Michigan legislature this last year, which is going to uh, just dramatically change a number of people's lives. But I saw that in my job at Detroit and, and getting those criminal records expunged was an equity issue, was an economic development issue, was a workforce development issue, and was a tool to combat uh, intergenerational poverty. But at the end of the day, uh, all of this came back to decisions that were being made by county prosecutors because the truth of the matter is uh, all of this is the ripple effect 
of a, a decision made by the prosecutor who decides whether to charge, with what to charge, whether somebody gets an opportunity at rehabilitation and treatment, or whether they are instead going to go through the traditional adversarial justice system. Uh, and you know, that's really what motivated me to run for office is this idea that we could do better. Uh, folks in Washtenaw County, where I was born and raised and where I'd been living since I moved back to Ann Arbor, they were looking for a challenger to our incumbent prosecutor. And uh, somebody got the crazy idea that, that I, a non-prosecutor, might be a good candidate. Uh, and, and some of the activists approached me. And my first reaction was, was, I have no interest in doing that. What are you talking about? I'm not even a prosecutor. Uh, but thinking about all the things I'd seen throughout my career, I started to think, uh, you know, uh, really it matters who's holding these levers and we need folks uh, in these positions that are cognizant of these collateral consequences. So I sort of told them, uh, you know, I'll do it, but uh, I'm going to run a very different type of campaign than the sort of law and order campaign that we've seen in the past. So if you want somebody that's just, you know, uh, a little bit to the left or a little bit more progressive than the current uh, prosecutor, I'm not your guy uh, and no, no hard feelings. They said, no, that's exactly what we want. Uh, we'll, we'll support you. So I said, fine, I guess I, I, I laid out my terms and now I have to do it. Uh, uh, so I did it. And, uh, you know, uh, a couple of years later, uh, here I am. So a winding path, but um, that's, uh, that's what led me here. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting that you mentioned, you know, the importance of your clerkship. I think uh, a lot of my interest in criminal justice system also came out of my time in a clerkship where I saw the huge caseload that came on that side of the docket. And also, you know, it, it did become clear. I mean, I think I thought about it in a little bit of a different way but that there was so much room for improvement and coming from a, uh, a background in economics and empirical work, my thinking from the very beginning was this is a place that somebody who wants to, to make a difference in the world can really um, uh, do it. So um, it's, it's uh, but I, I have to say, maybe in, uh, like you up until a few years ago, I, I'd never thought about running for office. And, and one of the reasons why uh, I think that would, you know, would have been maybe difficult for you is you didn't come out of an office. And so going into it, um, how did you develop your, your, your priorities, your, uh, I, I mean, I, I understand that you probably started with, you know, things have to change, but when you get down to, to nuts and bolts, um, how did you decide what to tackle first and what you wanted to, you know, be the, 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 the policy change you announced on, on day one? Sure. So, I mean, the, the, the truth of the matter is, first and foremost, it was uh, through uh, in conversation with uh, community members. Uh, you, you know, my campaign didn't start by going to the uh, incumbent prosecutor and sort of asking for permission, which is the typical way that you do it. Uh, I, I, I was intending to challenge him and then he retired a couple of weeks later. Uh, so, so that wouldn't have gone too well, I don't think. But it really started with activists and with folks, uh, particularly in, in our black community on the east side of the county that, that felt as though uh, things had not been proceeding well and were really looking for change. And so, uh, you know, we started, we had those conversations and we worked together and developed a platform. And one of the big things, you know, in, in consultation with the activists, with community members, uh, with defense counsel, with people who had seen uh, the adverse cascading consequences coming out of the, uh, of the prosecutor's office and our, and our criminal justice system in Washtenaw County, um, one of the main things they said was there are these rigid policies that uh, the current prosecutor's office maintains zero tolerance policies for gun crimes, for example, uh, right? Uh, or, you know, if you are getting a opportunity to clear your uh, record because you are young, we, we have this, this uh, law in Michigan called the Homes Useful Trainee Act, which gives somebody an opportunity to get their record cleared if they're a young person and stay out of trouble for a little while. Well, if you do that, then we're not also offering you any sort of additional plea deal. They just had these rigid policies, which didn't take into account uh, the individualized circumstances of each and every case that comes through the justice system. So the very first thing, and I, and I promised that this was going to be my first act in office, uh, and I, I made good on it, uh, was we got rid of all the zero tolerance policies, uh, which precluded us from reaching a fair and equitable resolution. Uh, and, you know, all that means, it doesn't mean that we're going like light on 
gun crimes when it's people that are shooting at each other. But, you know, for example, we had a case out of Washtenaw County in which, uh, you know, a, a, a woman was transitioning. And uh, as folks who are transitioning uh, often experience, she was going through uh, some depression. And she told her partner one day that she was uh, going to go to the park and was going to kill herself. And so she drove her car to the nearby school with the gun partner called the police uh, and the police arrived and she didn't kill herself, thank goodness. Uh, but because she had a gun in a school zone, she was charged with a felony. Uh, now, I don't think anybody would say that that's an equitable outcome, that that was the right thing to do in that circumstance. But this is what the zero tolerance policies necessitated because that was technically a gun crime. Uh, and there's a whole host of other examples. They're maybe not as stark as that, but when you are precluded from taking stock of the individualized circumstances at the, at the center of each case, as well as the uh, cascading consequences that come from that, you're really not doing justice. I mean, think of that situation. What's gonna happen the next time somebody has a loved one that is uh, saying they're gonna kill themselves? Are they gonna call law enforcement like we would hope? Or are they just gonna let it ride and hope that you know their, their loved one doesn't follow through on it? Uh, so you've got to think about everything, not just whether the elements of the charge were met, but uh, what was actually going on and what are going to be the second order consequences. Uh, so that was my first priority. That was, you know, something that, that the community really uh, felt was unjust and was straining to change. Um, but, but, but all of our policies, you know, we talked through, we, we made these policies in consultation with the community. During our transition work, we put together transition teams across a dozen issue areas, which had over 170 community leaders, activists, subject matter experts uh, providing input on it. So we did everything uh, together, but ultimately it was uh, based in the communities that have been most affected by uh, the prosecutor's office over the past uh, several decades. What's a quick response that you give when people say, you know, how, how can you be a progressive prosecutor? It seems like it's internally inconsistent to be both progressive and a prosecutor. I, I'm sure you answer that question all the time. I, I, I have. And, and, and look, uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, I am not a prosecutor by training. And I will tell you that the cases that we see and the thought of putting somebody in prison in a lot of cases, uh, it keeps me up at night. And I never feel good about it. Um, it's part of the job. Uh, and I think that's what... Uh, some people chafe against when you say that, you know, you're a progressive prosecutor. Um, and I, I, I don't feel good about it. Uh, and I think that that's important. I don't think that you should want people in prosecutors jobs that feel gleeful or feel good about putting people away. Sometimes you have to do it for community safety's sake. And, and I own that. Uh, and it's a system that we have in the system that we're working in. But we should want people that feel uneasy about it because that is probably the most dramatic thing the government can do. Um, and look, at the, at the end of the day, I'm a harm reductionist. Uh, and I believe that it is important to, uh, you know, not let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And it matters who is pulling the levers in these prosecutor's office. It matters how discretion is exercised. It affects real people's lives in profound ways. And it's probably the most important thing for many people uh, that is going to happen to them in their entire life. So, uh, you know, you could, you could have a, somebody that deems himself a progressive prosecutor, or you could have somebody that's a traditional prosecutor. And the delta uh, between those two positions is huge gigantic in a lot of people's lives. And, and that should be really what we are focused on uh, at the end of the day. Great, great. So let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about policing and, um, and in particular, you know, the role you think a prosecutor's office ought to have in that domain. I mean, I, I think it's safe to say there's a reckoning in our country about the role of uh, police in our communities. And I'm curious what you think maybe broadly ought to change or how we ought to approach discovering what ought to change and also, you know, what, what, what the prosecutor's office in particular ought to do. Yeah. So, you, you know, it's, a, it's a great question and uh, we are one actor in the criminal legal system. Uh, prosecutors don't run police departments. Prosecutors uh, can't tell police uh, officers what to do. Uh, that said, there are things that we can do downstream 
uh, that hopefully can uh, incentivize uh, police officers to um, you, you know in, in, engage in behavior and activity that uh, more accurately reflects their their, their mission to uh, provide equal justice and to protect and serve. Uh, and one thing we've, we've done several of those things. One, you know, a few things that we've done is we've said, you know, we are just categorically not charging certain types of crimes, uh, you know, uh, uh, entheogenic plants, psychedelic mushrooms, right? Uh, marijuana crimes, uh, buprenorphine, which is a, a, a medicine that is used for people with uh, uh, opioid use disorder to, to, to get them sort of weaned off of what may be a more dangerous drug in terms of heroin or fentanyl. And it's our hope ultimately that if we're not charging it, it means police aren't arresting for it. Um, beyond that, uh, we've uh, put in place certain policies around, for example, pretext stops, uh, which are a, a species of traffic stops which are highly associated with racial profiling. Uh, you're pulled over in your car for a minor traffic violation, and the officer uh, comes up to you, and you know they have no other reason to search your car, but they say, you, you wouldn't mind if I just looked around a little bit for, for drugs or guns or anything like that. Uh, and most people don't feel like they can say no to police officers and sometimes they find stuff. Uh, and the reason that they pull people over uh, is largely to engage in that type of fishing expedition. We issued a policy that said, we're not charging people based on pretext stops if it's, uh, if it's one of these contraband crimes. And it's our hope that at the end of the day, that means officers aren't going to engage in it because they know that it, you know, if they catch a fish out of that fishing expedition, we're gonna throw it right back into the water. And that's really important, I think, in terms of rebuilding trust between communities of color in particular and law enforcement, because you shouldn't have to wonder when you're getting pulled over because you know, if you're like me, you don't know how to use these um, these roundabouts, right? Uh, you shouldn't have to wonder if really you're being pulled over because the officer is looking for something more. That's humiliating. It's degrading, and it and it makes a uh, what might be an unpleasant stop to be sure uh, really fraught with tension and potentially with danger. I mean, look at a lot of the. Uh, the, the, the horrible police killings that we've had in recent years, Philando Castile, right? Pulled over for a traffic stop. Uh, and he would be alive today potentially if it weren't for uh, the, the availability of pretext stops as an investigatory tool by, by law enforcement. But at the end of the day, I'm not somebody who's anti-police. I think that we all in the justice system uh, owe it to everybody to do everything we can to lower the tensions uh, between law enforcement and the communities that they serve. I can't direct it uh, as prosecutor, but what we can do is uh, minimize the incentive uh, for police officer to engage in what we know has been, uh, you know, some sort of tools of abusive behavior. And hopefully that will uh, change things in the long run. Great. Uh, uh... Uh, I think that's really helpful. And you, you started to, um, to, to get to um, a concern I had in talking about your policy on pretext stops, which is resistance from police generally, not just to you know, the philosophy behind your uh, policies, but also to, um, to try to evade some of these policies. So you know, how, how do you think about, or how do you, how do you expect to deal with um, potentially a drop in pretext related stops? Sure, but a rise and other types of stops that aren't pretext stops that then generate uh, the kinds of crimes uh, your uh, uh, you know that often follow from pretext stops. Are, are you worried about that? Uh, the, the short answer is 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 yes, and you know of course uh, what what you'd be concerned about in that type of scenario is uh, you know officers say okay well you know we can't we can't make pretext stops anymore and we define pretext stops as the situation that I described, pulled over for a traffic uh, violation or you know, sort of a minor infraction and then uh, consent is obtained with, uh, uh, with, with sort of no uh, other justification to search the car. Well, what you'd be worried about is officers saying, okay, well, I know I can't use consent anymore. So what I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna make up a uh, probable cause to search, right? Uh, and I'm going to say things happened that didn't really happen, or uh, I'm going to embellish what actually did happen in, in the hopes that it will rise to the level of um, justification to search the car. That's a, th that's a concern. And you know, part of the part of this 
is, uh, you know, we're, 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 we're looking at data and I hope we get a chance to talk about our, our data partnership, JJ, because uh, you're, you're, you're very involved in that, as you know. Um, and, and we're going to look, uh, hopefully, at the, at the types of uh, stops and, and uh, whether, you know, you see a, a spike in, uh, you know, probable cause or plain search uh, stops in the aftermath of the pretext stop policy. But the other thing is I really believe in getting the right people in place in our office and empowering assistant prosecuting attorneys to, uh, to do the right thing. So one thing that we have in our pretext stop policies is we have a broad catch-all provision which says, look, uh, these types of stops you can't charge, period, if it's based on uh, this pattern that indicates a pretext stop. Uh, but also if you see a stop that violates what you think is the spirit of the policy, uh, feel free to decline it. Uh, now, this requires getting assistant prosecutors in place who are bought into this mission, uh, who care about this, and who, who believe that pretext stops are corrosive to communities. Um, but uh, if you do that and you empower them and you give them the discretion to decline charges and they're not afraid to do it, uh, then you can root that out and you're no longer playing sort of whack-a-mole with, with policy directives. Uh, you know, and, and, and I'll say, we, we, we've had a couple of those uh, already since we've issued our pretext stop policies. And, and and I'm proud of our prosecutors for saying, you know what, look, uh, not necessarily saying this is a pretext stop, but probable cause was very thin here. Uh, so, so we're declining it in the interest of justice. Great. So, so that leads me to sort of one last question about uh, policing and, and, and perhaps the audience will, will have others. But you recently issued a directive um, in which uh, the prosecutor's office has essentially recused itself um, in any, when, when you're considering or when anybody should consider charges against officers who engage in violence against um, uh, civilians. And I mean, given what you just suggested about you know, putting the right people in place in your office, I mean, one might think that your office is precisely the place mm -hmm. um, you know, that is focused, is trying to focus on changing the system rather than uh, the, the, that's the way it should be approached rather than bringing in an outside prosecutor uh, who, who, you know, who may be a, a, a traditional prosecutor to use, to, use, to use the term. So, so how did you think about that? And, and I assume there were lots of things pushing in both directions. How, how did you come to that uh, policy? Yeah, absolutely. So, so, so look, the first thing is just nationwide, uh, local prosecutors have done an absolutely horrible job at investigating and charging uh, incidents of police violence in their own communities. I mean, they, they, they just have. Uh, and you know you, you you need go no further than George Floyd's murder this past summer when uh, the Hannibal County Attorney's Office was was looking at the case. They brought these third degree murder charges, which is you know so low of a charge it doesn't even exist in the state of Michigan. And it was only once the uh, state attorney general took it over that you saw more serious charges based on you know look everybody saw the video right. So it's not like there was a lot to dig through. We all saw it clear as day, and yet the prosecutors were reluctant to do it. That is because in many ways, uh, you know, prosecutors just by virtue of the job, they work day in and day out with police officers. And so they have a sort of an inherent uh, conflict there because, you know, how are you going to charge somebody one day and then rely on, you know, maybe that uh, officer's partner uh, in, in a case that you have the next. So there's that aspect of it. Now, you might say, well, you're a progressive, you were elected as a progressive prosecutor. And, and as you say, JJ, you're, you're exactly who we would want to, to be taking this seriously. And how do we know that the next person that comes in isn't going to be uh, a lot worse on this and isn't going to have a sort of pro officer disposition? And I've heard that feedback and I've heard that feedback from, from activists that supported me. And my response to that is, is look, uh, I wanna be fair to everybody. And it is not just the case that I want to make sure that every officer that engages in, in uh, violence is charged no matter the factual circumstances. There are circumstances in which charges aren't warranted. Uh, but what is true is that when a locally elected prosecutor is overseeing the case, there is going to be pressure one way or the other and probably in both directions on that prosecutor to make a certain charging decision. My base happens to be more progressive activists. And I also don't want to feel pressured uh, or have my assistant prosecutors are making the decision to feel pressured to bring a charge against an officer where it's not warranted and ruin that officer's career and, and potentially ruin their lives because they're concerned about the political pressure. So uh, 
appointment of a special prosecutor just makes sense. Frankly, I think it should be the law because then you uh, just you, you don't leave it up to the prosecutors to uh, individually decide whether to do it. You just say, look, whether you're a more conservative, traditional prosecutor, or whether you're a more progressive prosecutor, this is something that's gut wrenching to the community and somebody that comes out of the community cannot be the one uh, making the decision, particularly when they are elected. So I just think it's best practice as a procedural matter. And that's why, you know, I, I made sure that it was one of our, our first week policies because I wanted to get out ahead of it before anything happened uh, so that I wasn't seen as skirting the issue one way or the other. Great, thank you. Um, so I guess I, I, I think now maybe it makes sense to turn to the question of disparities in the criminal justice system. I mean, of course, policing relates to that in an important way, but there are uh, a zillion other places where disparities creep creep in. I'd love to hear you, you know, how you think about that, uh, policies that you're pursuing to, to address that, um, or anything else you want to um, uh, talk about when it comes to uh, disparities? Well, is, is now is now where we get to talk about our uh, partnership? We can if you like. If you can, if <laughs> all you right, like. all right. So, 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 I, and I'm really excited about this. And and, and this was also one of my uh, campaign promises because the truth of the matter is that in the in the criminal justice system and especially in prosecutors' offices, there is an allergy to data and to metrics and to looking the racial disparity that. We all see if we, you know, just take a look at who's in court day in and day out uh, at looking at that square in the eye. Uh, and we were lucky enough in Washtenaw County to have a citizen group that just looked through publicly available records. Uh, so this is just scratching the surface, surface and uh, found that uh, under the previous administration, black people are between three and 29 times more likely to be charged with certain categories of crimes than are white people. Now, those are significant disparities, but uh, you know, prosecutors traditionally just look the other way when they occur. And what I'm really excited about is a partnership that JJ is spearheading. It's funded by uh, the ACLU of Michigan. It's called the Prosecutor Transparency Project. And what we are doing is we are opening up our office's files to, to JJ and to uh, Grady, another, another researcher at the, at the law school. And you know, we, we said, look, you have absolute access to our files. And JJ, correct me if anything's wrong on this, uh, but, but we want to know. Uh, every decision point in the prosecutor's office, where are we seeing disparate racial treatment? Take, for example, uh, you know, one of the disparities that was uh, uncovered by this community-led report. It found that Black people are approximately four times more likely than white people to be charged with felony drug possessing charges, right? Uh, now, there's a number of reasons why that could be. It could be because law enforcement is referring uh, drug possession charges, felony drug possession charges to the prosecutor's office at four times the rate uh, for uh, black people than they are for white people. It could be that we are declining uh, to bring charges disproportionately against white people. It could be that for similar circumstances, uh, we are charging white people with misdemeanors, but black people with felonies. It could be that white people disproportionately get the advantage of being able to go through a uh, rehabilitation or treatment program, uh, whereas black people don't. It could be some combination of all of the above. Uh, but we just don't know that if we don't drill down into the data and don't unearth those disparities. So that's one thing that we're doing uh, in partnership with uh, JJ and his team at U of M. Uh, the other thing though, is you've, you, you've, you've gotta be real about this and understand that you know no two cases are exactly alike. I talked about this with the zero tolerance policy, but it's also true when you're talking about racial disparities. What we should be looking at is where are we seeing racially disparate treatment? And you need to really look into the individual facts of every case to uncover those. So take, for example, a charge of resisting and obstructing an officer, right? Which, which basically means that you struggle with the officer in some way, or maybe even assault them when you're being arrested. Uh, you could take uh, you know, a white person, right? Uh, and, and potentially our, our office gets a charge uh, that's requested against a white person who struggles a little bit when they're being put into handcuffs, right? Uh, maybe we denied that charge. Maybe we said, we're not bringing that charge. That's not, uh, that doesn't constitute a resisting and obstructing charge. Uh, 
uh, uh, if you have a black person though, that was being charged when struggling with handcuffs, that's racially disparate treatment. But then if you have a, a, a third black person who, who punched an officer in the face uh, and we brought that charge, it's not really fair to say that's disparate treatment as between the white person who struggled with their handcuffs uh, and that black person who punched them in the face uh, because the two circumstances are different. So to, to my knowledge, uh, this, this uh, partnership that we have, it's certainly the first in the state of Michigan. And in terms of this qualitative assessment, assessment of it. Uh, it may be the most robust of its kind in the country. And I really think it's going to unearth a lot of uh, both uh, implicit and explicit, uh, potentially racially disparate treatment. And then we can take steps to address it. But until we actually look at what's going on in our own system squarely in the eye, there is no possible way that we can address that bias. So I'm, I'm tremendously excited that we're doing this, that we're embarking on this. So we've got, uh, you know, such a, such a great professor and and one of the the, the, the nation's leading criminal justice uh, empirical scholars and JJ leading the work. Um, and and, I, and I'm hopeful that we're gonna set the model not just for the rest of the state, but for, but for the rest of the country in terms of how to drill into data and then ultimately address these racial disparities. Wow, I think that sounds like a really fantastic uh, project. <laughs> I'm, I'm excited to see how it uh, comes out. Um, so let, let me uh, just turn to another place where we see a lot of uh, uh, disparities, um, which, may not track race directly, but ultimately wind up mattering to communities of color a great deal. And that's your policies on cash bail. You wanna talk a little bit about, um, ab about those and, um, and you know, how it's been going so far in particular uh, over uh, the last month and a half or so? Yeah, uh, so so this was the second policy that I introduced uh, when when I was elected, and uh, you know I, I am a adamant opponent of cash bail as a conceptual matter, just period, full stop. Uh, I think it's important to take a step back and look at what cash bail really is. Cash bail is a system in which you are arrested and uh, you are told that uh, you can go free from jail. This is all pre-trial, so it's before you've been convicted of anything but you're told you can go free pending trial if you come up with a certain amount of money out of your bank account to secure your freedom. Now, what that does is that means that a poorer person or a working class person, uh, even one who doesn't pose a danger to the community can sit in jail for days or weeks or months uh, simply because they didn't have enough money to pay to get out. Whereas a wealthier person, somebody who may actually impose uh, a threat to the community, they're gonna be able to buy their way out simply because they have money in their bank account. So by its very terms, cash bail is inequitable. And JJ mentioned the race part of it. Uh, it is by its terms, socioeconomically inequitable. It directly discriminates against people based on the size of their bank account, but it also directly discriminates against people based on their accrued wealth. And what we know in the United States of America is historically what we have done through governmental policy, through slavery, where labor was literally stolen from black people, through uh, Jim Crow, through discriminatory housing policies that prevented black people from owning homes, which is the single biggest driver of wealth in the United States of America. Um, we have a racial wealth gap in the United States because of these discriminatory policies. And then we layer on top of that a wealth-based classification through our class or cash bail system. It of course disproportionately affects black people uh, and people of color. And it has cascading consequences too, because the data shows that if you are sitting in jail for even a day or two, you may well lose your job if you're poor or you're working class, and then you might lose your housing. And then your kids may have to switch schools. And by the way, if your kids switch schools in the middle of the year, uh, unexpectedly, it's the equivalent of losing on average six months of academic growth. So we've imposed intergenerational harm and trauma based on a wealth-based classification system, to my mind, it's simply inequitable. So uh, what I said on uh, my first full workday of, of being prosecutor is, is we're no longer seeking cash bail as uh, the prosecutor's office. That doesn't mean that we're just letting everybody go pending trial. I, I agree there are people out there that need to be held uh, pending trial because they pose a danger to the community. Like if you, if you murder somebody, it's very unlikely that you are going to get out of jail. But the amount of money that you have in your bank account shouldn't play a role in that. So what our 
assistant prosecutors are directed to do is uh, to seek the least restrictive conditions that will nevertheless ensure public safety, but take money off the table entirely, right? Uh, so for really serious crimes, if, if we think there's no other way to, uh, to ensure community safety, we're going to seek to hold somebody in jail. Uh, in other circumstances, we may seek to impose non-monetary uh, restrictions, such as, for example, saying like you've got to be released only to a person that can ensure public safety and can watch over you. They may be very difficult to meet, right? Uh, so it may functionally uh, result in them staying in jail. But if they're able to meet them, then, then fine, they can go free. But note that that's a non-monetary condition that's difficult to meet that's actually based on dangerousness. It's not based on how much money you have in your bank account. For other stuff, we can you know, make use of tethers. We can make use of house arrests. If the reason that you're getting into trouble is because of a, a, a substance use issue or alcohol, uh, we can impose testing regimens. We can impose no contact orders. You, know, you, can't, uh, you can't use or use our own firearms uh, if we're concerned about that aspect of things. So it's really a much more individualized approach, but it takes money off the table. Uh, and the truth of the matter is, I mean, we're about a month and a half in and, and, and you know, people, people said, well, you're going to see anarchy on the streets of Washtenaw County because uh, you don't have cash bail anymore. And JD, I don't know what you think, but, uh, you know, I'm, 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 I'm sitting outside. I have, I'm not hearing uh, cascading gunshots outside of my, outside of my window. And, and the truth of the matter is we've kept the jail population low. Uh, there are people that are being held pending trial, but it's because they're dangerous and we think they need to be there. And we have not seen a spike uh, in crime. So, so, so I think it is, it is going well and I'm hopeful it sets the stage for uh, how we can move forward statewide in the future. I, I have to say, my, I'm not sure my hand is on the pulse of, of Ann Arbor streets these days since I, I don't, I mean, I, I pretty much sit in my house all day long if I'm not in my uh, office, but always in front of a a Zoom, it seems like these days. Um, so uh, I, I only have a few minutes before I'm going to open it up to questions from the audience. But I, I thought I might just give you an opportunity um, to talk about a, another policy of your choice. Um, and I, I want to let the audience know that um, you can actually see all of Ellie's uh, 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 policies that he's implemented. I, I'm just going to put in a link in the chat for anybody who wants uh, to check them out. Uh, there are so many that are interesting and worth talking about. But we unfortunately don't have enough time. So I'd just love to hear, you know, if there's another one you think that it, it you know, would fit into this discussion well, I'd love to, I'd love to hear you tell us about it. You know, I'm going to talk about a policy that, that, that I rarely get a chance to talk about um, because people are always focused on cash bail and zero tolerance and, and, and people love talking about marijuana uh, and, and they love talking about the sex work policy and, and, and all that stuff. But those, are, those are all good policies and I'm happy to talk through all of them. But I want to talk about our, our buprenorphine policy. Um, because this is a policy that is just directly going to save lives. And I think it gets to the more fundamental approach that I have in, uh, in terms of how we look at our justice system. Buprenorphine is a, a partial opioid agonist, uh, which uh, means it's usually uh, goes by the brand name Suboxone. It's a medically assisted treatment, uh, which means that if somebody is dealing with opioid use disorder, uh, they are using that as a way of controlling their cravings. It doesn't usually cause euphoric highs. You're generally safe to drive on it, but it still has, you know, it, it's still an opioid technically, right? And so it's still uh, a scheduled drug and uh, it, it's, it is a crime to possess it without a prescription. We issued a policy which said we are no longer charging uh, the unauthorized use possession or small-scale distribution of buprenorphine. Because what we know is that people that are using buprenorphine, they're not usually using it to get high. They're using it to get better. And the people that are engaged in small-scale distribution of buprenorphine, they're probably breaking some off for a friend who is also dealing with opioid use disorder and whose alternative is going to be to turn back to fentanyl or heroin or a drug that they can overdose on. Now, like a lot of our policies, you know, you get some pushback on this. You say, people say, look, uh, there's a law against it. There's a law against the unauthorized use or possession or, or distribution. You're talking about distribution of buprenorphine. Uh, and how are you as a prosecutor going to just come out here and say that we're not prosecuting it, you have a duty to uphold the laws that the legislature wrote. And I take that seriously. 
But at the end of the day, what we know from other communities that have done this, Chittenden County, Vermont, uh, enacted a similar policy and the overdose deaths fell 50% the following year without any noticeable adverse consequences. And this, by the way, is from the chief of police. So, so it's not from like some, some lefty progressive uh, person. It's from the chief of police of uh, Vermont's biggest county, which by the way, is particularly hard hit by the opioid epidemic. At bottom, that is a harm reduction technique. And so much of what we do is about harm reduction. Whenever the criminal legal system is involved, in many ways, uh, there has been a failure in the justice or, or in, in our society. Uh, nobody is in the criminal justice system as the victim or as the perpetrator of a crime or as a witness or anything uh, that wants to be there, that's having a good day. Harm has been done. And the question should be, what policies can we put into place that reduce that harm to the extent possible? It's something that we are directly doing with the particular issue of uh, opioids with our buprenorphine policy, but it really is a sort of guiding principle for our prosecutor's office as a whole. Great, thank you so much for, for all of that. And now I'm gonna invite uh, people in the audience to submit questions. I, I have five at this point, so uh, I'm hoping we, we have enough time to, to get through them all, but I, I'm just gonna start at the top and uh, some of them are on the long side, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to just to, to, to read them to pass them um, along. But um, the first question uh, essentially is about the, the, the dynamics of plea bargaining and charging and you know, how you will or um, what your approach will be to prevent plea bargains from being used to induce defendants to plead guilty when, when they might be innocent, just to, just to avoid um, uh, the risk of a much longer incarceration or in the case of something more minor um, uh, as a way to get out of uh, out of jail or maybe that won't be an issue here but to, to get it over with as soon as um, uh, possible so so ha have you thought about that how uh, you know do you have ideas for how to, uh, to 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 change that dynamic which is quite common in, in prosecutors offices yeah so, so so this is something that we address uh, via policy and there are certain policies that we put into place uh, that, that, I, that I'm hoping will minimize the coercive nature of plea bargaining and and look uh, I'll, I'll say this uh, plea bargaining you have to have plea bargaining in the criminal justice system it's just not set up to not allow for for plea bargaining and in some cases it can allow people to take responsibility and then to get on with their life. But coercive plea bargaining is a problem. And coercive plea bargaining occurs when prosecutors stack up charges, uh, charges that are not necessarily warranted in the interest of justice. And then somebody feels obligated to plead guilty to what the prosecutors wanted in the first place. Um, so a couple of things. Number one, by uh, eliminating cash bail and only seeking to hold people in jail that uh, we think pose a serious uh, threat. Uh, we've eliminated some of those coercive elements because a lot of times people will just plead guilty to somebody something because they're being held because they don't have money uh, on cash bail and they just need to get back to their families. So to the extent possible, uh, we've eliminated that and hopefully that leads to a fairer process. Uh, another thing that we have done is it was the, it was the previous policy of the prosecutor's office to always charge uh, what we have in Michigan, which is a habitual offender law, which can result in uh, a more than doubling in some circumstances of the amount of time that you face. It was just always like, just as a rule, you always just designated somebody as a habitual offender if they were eligible. We flipped that presumption. And now we, uh, our assistant prosecutors are precluded from making habitual offender designations unless they go up to their supervisor and they explain why we actually need a habitual offender designation to keep the community safe. Maybe there's some circumstances in which that's warranted. Every case is different, but we're not just applying it as a matter of course. And so that's a real driver, at least in Michigan, of a coercive plea bargaining because you know you can say, look, plead guilty to, 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 to X and we'll drop the habitual offender designation, right? Um, or we will never we will never seek it. Uh, but when that's off the table, it eliminates that threat of coercion. But the other thing is just about building culture, because the truth of the matter is, I don't see every single case that comes through our office. Uh, you know, I, I oversee about 50 people in the office, 30 attorneys and 20 support staff, and they're the ones that are making charging decisions every day. 
uh, and my my chief assistant prosecutor, who's fantastic, Victoria and I, you know, we've 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 got these policies, and the the gravamon of the office is uh, you always seek the the outcome that is least restrictive but serves public safety in the interests of justice. And the least restrictive part is important, right? And that's what we're looking for at the charging stage. And we've been having conversations, and we have a great staff at our prosecutor's office. I'm so pleased with the assistant prosecutors because they come to us, they have questions, we've talked through things. Do I charge this higher thing to gain leverage and plea bargain in negotiations? Uh, you know, well, do you think you can prove it up? Uh, well, yeah. Uh, well, okay, if you think you can prove it up, is it in the interest of justice, right? Is it really what you want? If it, Do you think that this person needs to serve the sentence imposed by the higher charge? Well, no. Uh, well, in that case, let's start from the position that we really think justice warrants. And maybe it means we take a harder line of plea bargaining, right? And we and we offer a less good offer and we may have to go to trial on it, right? Um, but uh, we've been having these conversations as much about building a culture as it is about uh, putting into place these policies. Uh, but the policies do in many ways drive the culture and uh, so do personnel decisions. And, and again, I'm just really uh, a month and a half in so pleased with the, with the incredible team that we have in the prosecutor's office because I think they are really committed to doing it right. Fantastic, thank you. So, so some of the questions, uh, my, my, uh, thinking about you, thinking about them, I, I'm guessing that some of them are going to be issues that you're hoping to deal with down the road, but they they either haven't presented themselves yet, or you just haven't had time. Only being a, you know a month and a half in the office. Um, but uh, <clears throat> the next question um, is about uh, uh, implicit bias uh, when litigating criminal cases in voir dire or or jury selection and you know, whether or not the, the prosecutor's office ought to think about how to address that. How do, how do we make sure that uh, people that you're prosecuting are, are, are not being subjected to that? Or, or do you think that that's, you know, in our adversarial system, something that uh, defense attorneys ought to be, to be raising and pushing? So, so, so I'll, t I'll tell you my, my honest to God, truth of the matter of view on this uh, in terms of voir dire. Uh, and in terms of jury selection. If you read the, the, the Supreme Court case, Batson versus Kentucky, which was the, the, the you know, 1980s case, which said that you can't uh, strike a juror because of their race, right? Um, which shocking that it was that late, but, but that's, that's the case. You read Justice Marshall's, uh, Thurgood Marshall's concurrence in the case, and what he said is, look, this is all well and good, but we're never going to get rid of uh, racial bias in jury selection until we get rid of this system of prosecutors, as well as defense lawyers, just being able to strike people from the jury pool because they, because of whatever, because they don't like the color of their shirt, because they don't like their job. That's often code for uh, implicit bias and sometimes just cover for explicit bias. I happen to agree with that. I would like to, as a as a policy matter, get rid of what we call peremptory strikes in jury selection entirely. So I agree with Justice Marshall. Now I've I floated this idea, and what I said to defense counsel is, "What do you think about this? We'll give up our peremptory strikes if you give up yours, right? Because we can't have a, an unequal playing playing field, right?" Uh, and the defense counsel said, oh no, uh, you're not getting away with that. Uh, we're really good at, at, at uh, picking out the people that are gonna be uh, horrible jurors for our side. And we like our peremptory strikes and there's no way we'll ever, we'll ever agree to that. So that was my brilliant idea around voir dire. And unfortunately, uh, defense counsel generally do, do, doesn't seem too, too keen on that. So I don't, so, so, so the truth of the matter is uh, that was my brilliant idea around that. I don't know how you get rid of implicit bias other than getting rid of peremptory strikes. Uh, you know, look, I'll, I'll, I'll say this. Obviously, if you commit a Batson violation in my office, you're fired. Uh, and and there's there, there's just no two ways about that. If you strike somebody because of their race uh, explicitly, uh, you're, you're fired. Uh, I, I won't stand for that. But implicit bias affects all of us. It just does. Uh, and when you're when you allow a system in which people are allowed to be struck from a jury because you know you you just have a weird feeling about them. Um, I don't know how you get around that without getting rid of the institution of peremptory strikes. So I'm hopeful that, you know, maybe there can be some move on a legislative level, but uh, the truth of the matter is the defense bar likes these. Um, uh, and so uh, if folks have any brilliant ideas, I'm always open to them. Well, uh, well, also, what about, I mean, what about implicit bias on the part of uh, jurors that remain, regardless of, of race, who might, who might come to, you know, come to, uh, uh, to the table with certain views? I mean, 
I, I, I imagine that you could think about how to instruct them, to remind them that people are subject to implicit biases, that, that you may not be aware of them, and you should, you know, you, you know use of debiasing strategies. Is that, is that something that you've thought about or something that might be down the road? Yeah, and 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 the, the truth of the matter is, we we I haven't thought a lot about doing this with jurors. In some ways, uh, you know, this is something I think we'd, we'd want to work with the court on because I don't think that you'd necessarily trust. Uh, uh, instructions around implicit bias that comes out of a prosecutor's office, uh, just in, just institutionally, right? And 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 look, I'm obviously sympathetic in a le- in a lot of ways to uh, you know folks who are who are on the other side of the room from the prosecutors in in, in terms of criminal defendants. But at the end of the day, we it's, it's also an institution, and and I and I don't think that uh, instructions. Uh, around bias coming from prosecutors is necessarily a good idea, but but I think it's something that we 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 can work on. Uh, but at the end of the day, I mean, really, the best the best way is to probably screen for it more robustly during voir dire, uh, because you can you can tell people please remember to disregard your implicit biases. But their implicit biases are implicit for a reason, and probably better that you're able to uh, figure that out if there's some you know uh, way of doing that during voir dire and get those people off the jury in the first place. But that's something that I really think we'd have to work with the defense bar as well as the courts uh, on doing. I don't think it's something that's that, that's necessarily uh, uh, would, would be best served as a one-sided thing from the prosecutor's office. Got it, got it. That makes sense. So um, I'm going to combine the next two questions. So so somebody asks about uh, your thoughts of restorative um, uh, justice and when you decline to prosecute uh, a case for whatever reason, um, uh, do you support or how do you support um, getting people to social services? And, and related to that, somebody um, asked a more general question about um, uh, how to think about uh, or, or, or uh, the, the, uh, actually, the, the, the questioner thanked you for mentioning the importance of trauma at the beginning and to, um, to, to ask you about how you think about uh, trauma and, and taking a trauma, uh, 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 I guess, uh, uh, a, a trauma-informed approach to, to, your, to your job. All of those questions are combined? Well, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, to, <laughs> yeah. to raise questions about restorative no, no, justice and healing <laughs> and what you're doing on that score. So, okay, so 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 restorative justice actually that that's something that we've got in the works, and I'm really excited about it. Uh, restorative justice, for those who who don't know, is a survivor-centered uh, model of justice that uh, basically, if the survivor of a crime wants it, uh, instead of going through the traditional adversarial justice system, uh, after a period of intense preparation, uh, the survivor and the person who committed harm come together, and the person who committed harm, who would otherwise call the criminal defendant, uh, has to acknowledge the harm that was done, accept responsibility, and then together they work out a plan uh, to make amends that's individualized. Now, now, uh, this really works, and survivors prefer it at huge rates. If you look at common justice, which is the, 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 the best model around restorative justice in the country, it's, it's run uh, out in Brooklyn. When given the choice, 90%, and I'm not kidding you with that number, 90% of survivors opt for restorative justice rather than the traditional adversarial uh, approach to justice, which may seem surprising, but if you really think about it, what a lot of survivors want is uh, the acknowledgement that they were harmed and the acceptance of responsibility, as well as something tangible that that can, to the extent possible, mend harm. And that's precisely what our adversarial justice system is set up to disincentivize, right? The minute that you acknowledge that you did the harm and accept the responsibility as a criminal defendant, you are uh, pleading guilty, and then you are going to be punished. And what does that punishment ultimately get the survivor? Well, it may give them some comfort that the person that harmed them is off uh, the street for a little bit, but at the end of the day, they don't get much out of it. It's not individualized. It doesn't get them what they need. And often, and this gets to the trauma point, uh, the experience of going back into court and facing your accuser and testifying uh, and being cross-examined can be tremendously traumatizing and re-traumatizing for the survivor of a crime who did nothing wrong to put themselves in this position. So it's no wonder that uh, folks often prefer restorative justice rather than the adversarial justice system when given a choice. By the same token, it prevents recidivism because you see uh, folks who would otherwise be criminal defendants, they internalize the harm that was done. Uh, when, you, when you're in the adversarial justice system, you're 
you, you just put up walls, right? Uh, you're disincentivized from taking responsibility. You're disincentivizing from uh, understanding what harm you caused. And that in, in turn may lead you to commit a similar act again. So what we're, we're in the process of building out and, and in the coming weeks or, or maybe a couple of months, we'll be announcing this is we wanna give uh, every survivor of crime the opportunity. Uh, do you want restorative justice or do you want the traditional justice model? Now, there are, there's exceptions. If you've just shown that you're a real danger, if you like shot a gun at somebody or something like that, or if you've committed uh, a sexual assault in, 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 a, in a coercive way, then, then, then look, at the, at the end of the day, I, I, I think you do need to be separated from the community for community safety's sake. But with all other types of crimes that don't involve that coercive element or a severe public safety risk, we're going to give the survivor the option. Because at the end of the day, we always sit up here as prosecutors and we say, I, I stand for the victims, I stand for the survivors. And I, I take that seriously. These are folks who did nothing wrong and who were harmed. Standing for survivors means listening to them. It means giving them a choice. And that's what we're prepared to roll out with our restorative justice model. Now, with respect to the other parts of this uh, three-part question, um, uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I think that I think you I think you 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 hit a lot of uh, of that. So uh, I, I think uh, unless you have more you want to say. No, 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 no. We can we, we can move uh, on. I, I think I, I think you 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 did great there. Uh, uh, you know, just a, a couple more questions, and then I think we have to wrap it up. So one question relates to um, uh, your bail uh, policy and um, questions about uh, conditions. Um, some of the conditions for release, for example, using a tether, um, might be costly. And so the question is essentially, once you start imposing uh, conditions that might be costly, or for example, a tether, um, uh, you know, are you, are you gonna, uh, uh, is there some way to, to make sure that those conditions are equally, can be satisfied by everybody with equal difficulty, um, even if they come from very different socioeconomic uh, 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 positions? Yeah, and, and, and it, is a, it is a great question. And, and one thing that really bothers me about the tether system is that the tether system requires a user fee. Uh, and that's a fee that is put on the person who has the tether on them. And it can be quite expensive, uh, or at least in my mind, more expensive than it should be. I, I, I have asked a, a number of people this, and I still don't understand why it costs uh, like between six and eight dollars a day to put a GPS tether on your ankle because I've got I'm holding my cell phone now I've got a GPS tether that I carry with me all the time and it doesn't cost six to eight days and I can also uh, go on Instagram on it which uh, GPS tethers don't have the capability of doing so I don't understand why they're so expensive and the user fee can often end up causing precisely the type of, of socioeconomic harms that we're trying to avoid by eliminating cash bail I own that there is no question uh, uh, to that point. Um, so a couple things. Number one is, frankly, uh, a lot of times, uh, and, and, and I'll say this, but a lot of times the, we just don't go after the debt. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's set up in the system that uh, it's a user fee and there's no alternative source of, of paying for it. But um, most of our judges, if you, if you can't afford it, uh, they won't go after it. Um, so, so that's one thing, and I'm grateful to have such good judicial partners because we don't have that everywhere, uh, but we do have them in, in Washtenaw County. So, so, so that's um, a blessing. Uh, but the other thing is, is we really need to look more broadly at the way that we're funding uh, court operations and the way that we're funding court systems. And this goes beyond just a tether. Uh, you know, a lot of courts in Michigan and across the country are funded primarily via fines and fees, which provides an incentive to levy these on the backs of people who uh, may have come into the system because of crimes of poverty. And you're incentivized to do that because that's how you run your court operations. Uh, at some point, that, that just becomes a state funding issue. And I really think that, that one of the next fronts in broad criminal justice reform is changing the way that we fund local court operations because it's simply untenable that we continue to provide these incentives on judges to uh, impose fines, fines and fees on the, on the backs of poor people that may be in there in the first place because they committed a crime related to poverty. Uh, great. So um, we don't have too much time left, but just uh, a quick question or two, if we can get them in. One is what, you know, if, if for, for people who might be participating in, in, in prosecutorial elections in the future as voters, what are, what are the key questions you think 
people ought to be asking to try to to try to identify um, uh, you know uh, progressive prosecutors. Be as detailed as possible, and, and and I mean this because you see this in prosecutorial elections across the country. People want criminal justice reform right now, uh, but the way that you separate the the people that are really going to do things from the folks that are just repackaging old prosecutorial uh, decision making. If you if you agree with what I'm saying, if you don't agree with what I'm saying, then then you know. Vote, vote for whoever, I guess. Um, but but if you really want uh, uh, somebody who's who's progressive, I think it's important to drill down and say and, and say what do you exactly mean by that? It's not enough to say, oh yes, mass incarceration is horrible. Oh yes, we need to end the the criminalization of poverty. Oh yes, racial inequities in the system are bad. Right? Everybody can say that. It's window dressing. Look for specific plans. Are you going to seek cash bail? When you say you're not going to seek cash bail, are you talking about not seeking cash bail across the board? Or are you just talking about it for low-level misdemeanors that, you know, where people are often, in a lot of places, released on personal recognizance anyway, so you're not really moving the needle all that much? What are you doing in terms of sentencing? I think one way to really separate uh, more progressive prosecutors from from non progressive prosecutors is is to look at what they're doing in terms of sentencing enhancements right. Um, because those are for serious crimes, uh, they just are for serious crimes but mass incarceration in this country is driven as much by overly lengthy criminal sentences 20 years in prison versus 10 years in prison, both of which are a long time and JJ knows this better than me because he's done the research on it. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the, the marginal benefits of another year in prison, most people just age out of crime anyway. Uh, so you're really not getting too much. So asking prosecutorial candidates around sentencing enhancements, right? Uh, when are you going to seek 20 years? When are you going to seek life? Are you ever going to seek life without parole for a juvenile? Which, by the way, anybody that says they're a progressive prosecutor and, and says they'll seek life without parole for a juvenile, which is illegal in over half the states in the country, uh, is not a progressive prosecutor. So uh, those are those are questions that, that, that I would ask at least. All right. Well, with uh, with apologies to, to people who are uh, left on the queue with great questions um, and and feel free to, to send them either to me or Ellie, if, if you wish, um, I'm going to hand it back to Alana to wrap it up. Thank you, JJ, and thank you to Ellie um, for joining us tonight and for your great discussion and the questions um, and We'll go ahead and send these questions to both of you. So if you would like to answer them, um, we can send them to the um, people who asked them after the fact. Um, Sounds good. Great. Great. Haley, do I have some slides to put back up? Yay, there we go. Um, here are some recommendations um, from JJ and Ellie about some books and articles that you can read on the topic if you want to read more about um, criminal justice and criminal justice reform. Um, these, you don't have to write these down right now. We will be emailing this out to you in the post event email as well. Um, but these are some of the um, articles, podcasts and books that you can read if you wanna learn more about the subject. Um, we also have a lot of events coming up in for UMDC um, next week sorry, tomorrow, we have Podcast Club, um, which is our monthly club. It's like a book club, but it's a podcast club. Um, it's Next Big Idea Range, Why Generalists Succeed in a Specialist World. Um, if you're interested in that, please go to the website and email Haley so she can add you to the email list. Um, next week, we have The 51st State, which is a film put together by Arena Stage um, and a conversation for Black History Month with a couple of the um, individuals who wrote the, who wrote the play which was turned into a film, um, which will be a great event. So please go ahead and register for that. We also have next week have book club. Um, sorry, in March, we have book club. Um, another event that's not on here yet is March 24th. We're gonna have an event with the Ford School, which is a look at the Biden administration and what they've done so far. So definitely check that out. And on April 14th is our big event of the year. Um, it's our congressional breakfast. It's, it's our biggest event of the year when we're in person. And we're hoping to make it a great big event this year virtually as well. Um, this year, our, our main speaker is Congressman Ted Deutsch, who is a Michigan alum for his undergrad and law, in law, in law degrees and represents um, the 22nd District in Florida, um, which is Fort Lauderdale, Miami area. Um, and we're also going to be joined this year by Coach Jawan Howard, um, who will be sharing some remarks with us, um, which will be super exciting. So um, registration for that is not live yet, but it will be live this week, definitely by Thursday. Um, so definitely go onto our website and make sure to register for Congressional Breakfast. Um, 
as Haley just put in the chat, please also make sure to follow us on social media. We're doing some really fun and interesting things on Instagram and Facebook right now. Um, so make sure to follow us on, on Facebook and Instagram and our um, links to our Facebook and Instagram are in the chat where Haley just put them. Um, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. We hope that you enjoyed the program. Thank you again to Ellie and JJ for joining us tonight. Um, and I look forward to seeing you all at an event soon. Thank you, go blue. Thank you, go blue. Thanks everybody.